I'm going to cut off my video <coughs> and um, and I guess if you want to mute yourself as well. Um, hey, Megan, are we live? Uh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right now I'm trying to see April on the screen. Are you trying to share the screen for the baby? I'm trying to have my logo up. Um, let's see. Thought it would be the logo. No. Uh, nope, it's not working, I guess. Fascinating. So who's on the screen right now? Uh, okay, you are on the screen right now. My face or the logo? It just flashed between the two. Hmm. So right now I'm seeing just the name, Jesse Cole, not even the logo. Interesting. <laughs> Hello, Aaron. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. Welcome, folks who are listening. Um, it is eight o'clock, so I guess we'll get started. Hey, April, you there? Yes, I am. Hang on one second. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yep. Um, so, welcome, everybody. We managed to actually get this thing working uh, ahead of time, which was cool. And then we tried the extra fancy. It seems extra fancy to me. Uh, have like the the logo up. Uh, until eight o'clock, and I don't think that worked, alas. But uh, here we are, starting right at eight. Uh, so Jesse Hool here, doing the latest in our series of kitchen table chats, which are at various tables that we, that for me is kind of a kitchen sometimes. Uh, with whoever will join us in different installments. And today I am joined by April Brown, who is the former chairwoman of the Libertarian Party, and. Um, is figuring something out right now. So, hi, April. Hi. Sorry about that. My husband walked in. It's all good. Yeah. That's uh, that's the the fun thing about these is I really feel like it is kind of like these in our house. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the impetus for this, uh, April had reached out. Um, right. W were you still in the midst of waiting on test results? When you had yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was the day actually. Basically, what was going on was uh, my husband was checking off all the. Can you can you can you do this in another room, please? Oh, I wanted to hear what you were gonna say. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. I love you too. You can watch it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, A very modern world. We're like, it's nice to see you right here, but watch me on Facebook from another room. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's funny. It's like uh, basically <clears throat> for about a full week, my husband was experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and it was really scary. Uh, at first he was just feeling nauseous and I was like, oh, you know, stomach ache, especially since at that time it was Easter Sunday. We had gone an entire Lent because we're traditional Anglo-Catholics. Uh, we went an entire Lent of going vegetarian. And then on Holy Saturday, we broke our fast and he had a steak about that thick. So I was like, well, of course you feel nauseous. But he was, for the next day, he was feeling really weak. And then he started developing a cough. And so he had to call our teledoc service that I have through my work 
and they were concerned enough to overnight a test. Okay. And then his symptoms were start, were continuing to grow. He had this really hollow, very constant cough that was causing him pain in his chest and his throat. And um, and then one day he actually had to text me uh, saying, "I can't smell anything. I can't taste anything." Because uh, basically, as soon as we got word that we're sending a test out. Um, we instantly quarantined him and then as a precaution quarantine pretty much everyone else like as soon as he went up to the bedroom i started spray disinfecting downstairs the kitchen the living room any spot that i knew that he sat at and i pretty much made it for a roommate and i uh to say nobody's allowed in the living room one person at a time in the kitchen and we're all just going to stay in our bedrooms and I was thinking very lucky that this happened where we live now because we've actually got a three bed, three bathroom townhouse versus when we first moved to Athens, which was a tiny, tiny little one bedroom, one bathroom apartment. No idea how we would have done it then. It, we, would have, we would have been able to done it, but it would have been a lot more difficult if Jacob didn't have his own, uh, if own room, own bathroom. Um, but that's how we communicated was by text because he couldn't even talk on the phone. And then I would bring him up his meals and I would set it uh, on paper plates and plastic cups because I didn't want to touch his dishes that he had touched. And I would set it on a stool, knock on the door and either quickly run downstairs or go into the room across the hall, shut it and let him grab his stuff. So we, so for six days, I didn't see my husband's face. And that, that was really painful for me, knowing that your loved one, the person that you swore to be with till death do you part is in the next room. You can't do anything because then they might spread it to you and then you might be a carrier for someone else and all that. Mm -hmm. So I had been uh, kind of pretty vocal about being supportive of what I consider reasonable shelter in place laws. Um, I really wish that uh, the governor had taken more of a, uh, more of an influence from our mayor, Kelly Gertz. I was very impressed. And I made it very clear and um, Mayor Gertz knows this, that I don't agree with him on everything, on everything. Mm -hmm. But he's always been very gracious about listening to anybody. I mean, after he got elected, he, me and my uh, vice chairman, our former vice chairman now, uh, went to academia and had a beer with him. And I told him about my concerns about some of his policies. But I'm very impressed with how he handled it. And my vi former vice chairman was as well, because my former vice chairman is actually a nurse at one of our local hospitals here in town. <laughs> and I got some flack uh, from party members and all that. And leading up to my husband contracting what we thought was COVID-19, and I'll explain that later, um, I would get into arguments and debates with people online to the, now I'm at the point to where it's like, I just drowned it out. I don't care. You got something to say after I post something, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, we're but, also uh, inundated it, with the online dialogue, right? <laughs> And so, and it was because I, I've always been one of those people to where it's like any situation when it came to governing a particular subject, talk to people who are actually involved in that subject. So I would always, uh, you know, if you have questions or concerns about small business and you want to uh, do something to help uh, to make laws as far as small businesses, ask the small businesses. Um, when uh, Athens Clark County was talking about, or I should say one particular commissioner was talking about uh, adding uh, the minimum drink price to, uh, to alcohol in our bars all across the county, 
I, I kept screaming to myself, it's five bars that we have issues with. It's five of them. It's literally a handful. Why don't you talk to the other bars, see how they're doing things, and maybe we can start implementing those. So I've always been like, talk to the experts, talk to the people that you're going to be directly affecting. Yeah. And so when it came to the COVID-19, I'm not a doctor. I have no experience in the medical field, but I do have a lot of family that does. My mother is, is a retired uh, radiographer. My mother-in-law is a nurse. My sister-in-law is a nurse. My aunt is a nurse practitioner. My vice chairman, yada, yada, yada. And so I was listening to them and they're like, oh, I, at that time, you know, when it was early, they were already starting seeing cases and they were having to pull 12 to 24 hour shifts. They were having to wear the same mask for a full 12, sh 12 hour shift. And even my vice chairman, who is, you know, maybe a m bit more, I should say, conservative uh, than me. I hate using that word, but, uh, but he, he even said the way that Athens Clark County handled it by putting a shelter in place early really helped a lot. And it helped a lot with saving, uh, with, uh, saving space. And now we're, now they, they say they feel confident if they go through a surge. So, so could I jump in here for a second? And, um, sure. I, I guess I kind of wanted to, um, maybe take this, uh, uh, one piece at a time with, um, yeah. Cause I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I'm ADD. Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, you, you really laid out a lot of, I think, what, what brought us here. You know, we kind of want to talk about our, our mm -hmm. journeys through the um, political identities that we've both shared or held individually. And um, and I, I, it, my sense is that your recent experience with coronavirus has really kind of been a, a tipping point for you in thinking about things differently politically. Um, but given that literally everybody watching this is enduring the very same situation of being in a pandemic, even though it's playing out very differently for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. the power of storytelling uh, and like our just our own ordinary people experience, I think, is really great. So I really, really appreciate you sharing yours. And honestly, like, were it not for you, we wouldn't be here having a discussion focused on this in the first place. So mm -hmm. um, we, we conveniently have the excuse of the political party stuff to talk about too. Um, but but really, we're all enduring this coronavirus thing, and something that I haven't really been talking about on the internet much, but we were originally planning to do this last week and we had to postpone it because uh, Megan, my partner and I who lived together went through uh, a similar personal scare where we both got sick at the same time and had to go through the uh, very paranoid and very isolated experience of, you know, quarantining and waiting on test results. And it, we were fortunate that this happened at a time when testing was available in a greater capacity mm -hmm. to the public health department than it was weeks ago. Um, you know, obviously we're fortunate that we have a place to live. We didn't have to deal with what you and your husband did, which is being isolated from each other. You know, we both got mm -hmm. sick at the same time. So it was like, well, right. whatever we've got, we're in it together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was profoundly scary. And most of that fear wasn't about the experience of being sick itself. Right. It was just sort of, honestly, like a negligible amount of sick compared to other times, I think I've, each of us have been sick in the past in our lives. It was like a mm -hmm. minor flu, but the, the kind of anxiety that really built around it really made it uh, one of the worst health experiences I've ever had. And, um, and so anyway, for anyone who's watching, everyone in question right now has all gotten negative test results and is feeling healthy, right? Your husband's also feeling good. So is that yes. true? Yeah. So, so we're, we're coming from a good place right now and, and I think kind of beginning to reflect in real time on this chat. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious for you, you talked about something that, I, that I'd love to give a little more airtime to, which is, had you lived in the place that you used to, it would have been totally different. And a lot of the information we're hearing about how to handle if you're sick at home tends to mm -hmm. talk uh, about how to isolate the sick person if there's only one sick person. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of all the measures I'm reading about for handling things at home sort of presume that you live in a space that's big enough to do that, right? And, and many of us don't. I mean, the truth is, if Megan and I had to, if only one of us was sick and we were trying to adhere to those rules, we probably couldn't have anyway. We live in a very small space where we are. Um, so I guess I'm curious your thoughts, like if, if you it sounds like you were kind of going through processing that even while it was happening. I remember you telling me 
like what do you think would have been different and, and what did that reveal to you about um, I, your living situation dictating how it played out? It'd probably be similar because uh, my dad actually, right when this was really hitting the fan, mm -hmm. uh, had a scare because as this was really hitting the fan here in the United States, my parents were on a cruise. By the time they left the United States, this wasn't really a concern, but then when they were on board, then it was really a concern. Mm -hmm. And of course, cruises are petri dishes, basically. Uh, yeah. So my dad came home sick with a fever and all that. And luckily, because because of the fact that he was recently out of the U.S. and because of his age, my you know my dad's in his sixties, uh, they wanted to go ahead and test him. And my parents, they live in they live in a trailer uh, out in uh, Carnesville, uh -huh. and it's pretty much because the way it's split because they share it with my grandmother. It's pretty much their space is a like one bedroom, one bathroom. Mm -hmm. So the way my parents did it was my dad was isolated in the bedroom my mom would sleep out in the living room in her recliner uh she would have to go through the bedroom to get to the bathroom so she would you know uh clean the doorknobs go in disinfect everything before she used it the shower the toilet and all that and then hurry up cover her face and walk right back into the living room and not really have any sort of interaction with my dad at all luckily for him, just like with Jacob, it was the flu. And um, it, it's interesting, my uh, teledoc service actually said there is a strain of flu, which is, was Jacob had, that's very similar to COVID-19. It's checked pretty much almost all the boxes. Um, which yeah, I mean, so was, many of the symptoms are just like, I feel generally sick, how? All the ways you kind of generally feel sick, you know? <laughs> it's like until you're, until you're really severe and having trouble breathing and need a ventilator, it's not clear that it's distinct from any other, you know, significant illness, food poisoning or, or flu or anything. And that's what I was really worried with my husband, because my husband is a very healthy individual, um, uh, constantly physically active and all that. And usually when he gets sick, a couple of days rest, maybe some video games, some over-the-counter meds, and he's fine. And this, he wasn't, he didn't start feeling fine until like day six, mm -hmm. uh, day five or day six. Uh, until when, because for those following days, he was just, it was the same. He wasn't getting worse, but he wasn't getting better. And that's the thing that really freaked me out. Cause I'm like, Jacob doesn't get sick like this. Pretty much the only boxes he did not check off is he never developed a fever and he never had shortness of breath. But it was something we were constantly monitoring. So, so those symptoms you described are super similar for Megan and I. Um, and sorry, that that shrug in the middle of you talking was Megan asking me. There's a there's a dog just going nuts barking outside in the neighbor's yard. I think so. Um, I guess if somebody in the comments wants to let us know if that's actually like peeking out the audio and we'll close the windows or something. But, uh, and I do want to give a shout out real quick. Please, at any point, if people have thoughts or questions, uh, throw them in the chat. And there is a bit of a delay, so you know we won't get to them until a minute or more after you write it, probably. Um, but a few folks say hi, April. Uh, so Chris Dowd and Celia Lasada both say hello. And Chris asks me to talk about my support for Ron Paul. So yeah. we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, to talk about the symptoms thing, you know, we, we had a similar experience where um, we were sick with most of the symptoms. You know, they, they read off a list to us. And it's like, well, we have all those except the two most serious. We didn't have a fever. Mm -hmm. We weren't having trouble breathing, except when we were feeling really anxious. And we're like, I'm pretty sure that's just because I'm like kind of having a panic attack, but I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually able to breathe just fine. Um, and it was, I, it's been helpful to learn since then. I think there's a few things I kind of want to share for people who are watching now or may watch this later. So there's like a way that difficulty breathing plays out with COVID that isn't just like that, like a, like a kind of panic anxiety attack feeling of difficulty breathing is not what it's like. It's more like you can't get a deep breath. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, um, so it was helpful. Like when Megan and I would try to help each other, like slow down and take a deep breath. And it's like, are you capable of taking a deep breath? Cool. Like that's not, that's not what people are talking about when they're talking about COVID. 
Um, okay. And we had to keep doing that almost every day. We, we sort of traded off. One day I'd be really panicky, and then the next day Megan would. Um, like I can only imagine how much harder that would be in a situation like you, where you and your husband had to stay in separate rooms and couldn't really do that like face to face, like breathe with me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I, I think you know, kind of getting past, we're not medical experts, right? We're just right. kind of regular people. You have a lot more family experience and direct connection of people who know a lot more than I do, right? But I think for a lot right. of folks, we're just kind of like suddenly trying to make sense about how to radically alter our lives in a way where we're being like responsible, you know, stewards of health and community um, without really being able to sift through the noise of like what is true and what is not. And of course, even people who have a very scientific approach um, are learning new information all the time and and what we're fundamentally Mm. dealing with is a lot of uncertainty. Um, But then we have people who are feeding us a lot of kind of crap information, right? Um, and, and I guess this feels like as good a time as any to sort of segue into the response from a lot of government officials in the United States has been uh, like, I would describe it as like horrifically disappointing, like, you know, it definitely endangering people and, and putting certain ideologies uh, or lack thereof <laughs> um, uh, in front of uh, human health and human well-being. And, when I think of like an adage that's resonated with me for at least a, a decade now of you know people over profit, um, if there's an example of people putting profit over people, that seems especially poignant and immediate and constant in our like uh, American Georgian Athens society. This seems to mm-hmm. be it, you know. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm curious. I, I could go on about that, and I'll save it for later. But I, I'm curious for you, if you could describe how it seems like this experience for you really changed how you saw some things politically. And I was hoping you might uh, just kind of take a moment to describe what that process was like for you. Um, and if you want to start before, like if that shift was already beginning before this, or if it was sort of spawned mm-hmm. by this, and then I guess like what changed. And I'll be listening, mm-hmm. but have to step away to get better light. So I'll be right, I'll be right back. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Megan's got it. Megan's the tech expert. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so please. <laughs> okay. Um, things have, uh, but some things have changed and then the, some things have kind of stayed the same. Like mm-hmm. one thing that was not very quote unquote libertarian of me, but it was still something that I was, I wasn't against was uh, some form of option of Medicare, uh, Medicare for all expansion of Medicaid not necessarily uh, not what i don't want is the same system we have uh, you choose either forcing to go to your employer or you have to go through the medicare for all system uh what i wanted and it's what a lot of libertarians want and it's what uh ron paul wanted who again was a doctor was uh to alter the rules of health insurance and all that to where they would have to compete and they would have to dr- and they would have to have some sort of incentive to drive down prices instead of constantly feeding money into their uh, Republican and Democratic fee banks uh, to make sure that they had patents and all that. But I, at the same time, I knew that there were people who, you know, it's just like after you have a certain amount of accidents on a car, good luck in car insurance. If somebody's really sick and has constant issues, you know it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a backup system to where they could, uh, to where if they wanted to, they could go to to make sure that they weren't in debt up to their eyeballs and medical bills and that they were taken care of. Um, and so that was something, and there are a lot of libertarians that actually do believe in a system similar to that, to where it's a, a, private, a mix of private and public, um, but it's not something that in, a, in the big libertarian circles you want to get into because you don't want to deal with that one guy. <laughs> that one guy, um, yeah. That one guy is in any circle. It's not just libertarian. I mean, you pick your, exactly. pick your word, that's your excuse for getting a group of people together. There's always that one guy. And also, you know, and uh, Chris Dowd will be very interested, will be, be very interested in hearing this, having conversations with him and Mocha Johnson about as far as expanding Medicaid, you know, I, at first I was against that. And then I kind of was like, well, 
you know, the money's kind of already there, well, um, uh, and all that. So, but it was mostly because it, I think whether you're libertarian, Democrat, uh, Republican, whatever, it's, the thing is I always told people is that we all had the same goals. We just had different ideas on how to get there. I firmly believe, and I still believe this, that there's the majority of the people in this country don't want other people to be poor. They don't want them to go without health care. They don't want them to go without a job or being taken care of, things like that. We just have different ideas on how to achieve those goals. Um, but as far as like, uh, and I'm, and to this day, I think I still have a lot of my similar libertarian beliefs um, because I do consider myself a free market capitalist still. Um, but well, I hope we get time to discuss that a little bit before we're all done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, also, my I do have an issue with how some companies have responded to this. Uh, I do know of uh, personal experience with friends and all that that their companies literally waited until the last possible moment until the the county or the state forced them to to say, hey, you got to do something besides just disinfecting something with industrial disinfectant at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, get your kid, get your employees working from home, things like that. Um, I had no issues with adding that extra $600 for uh, a month for unemployment or that extra $600 on the unemployment. I had, and honestly, like I got into an argument with a couple of libertarians who thought that when Governor Kemp decided to reopen Georgia or give the option to reopen certain businesses, there were a couple of libertarians I did see that thought that if you said, I don't feel comfortable going to work, then you should lose your unemployment. It was like, well, what about the person who's a diabetic or the asthmatic or the person taking care of their elderly family? That's a legit concern of not wanting to bring that into your house or having it happen to you. So why and should so they- so for you, when this was happening during coronavirus, was were you starting to see the why shouldn't they? Was that question coming up differently for you or more often or resonating in a different way than it did before this? Or were you already kind of thinking along those lines? Sorry, I, maybe I just kind of missed a little mm -hmm. bit, like that timeline of when you started to, to, to notice that shift. Because it seems like you already had an idea about like... Um, not exactly Medicare for all, but Medicaid expansion and various healthcare reforms that wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. be thought of as like traditionally libertarian going into this, right? Um, so did this sort of like expand that for you or was there kind of like a new a new level of seeing the yeah. new? Kind of, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain. Uh, let's see, how's the best way I could explain this? Um, basically I've always, and the reason why, and I, I tried to bring up this up with some libertarians that I would get, and I hated that I got in so many debates about this online, but you know, what else are you gonna do during quarantine? No, all we can do is debate online, yes. <laughs> Bake bread and debate online. Um, but uh, but um, I would, one of the things I would explain to people is like, like I mentioned, my husband and I were traditional Anglo-Catholics. My husband is actually going to be starting school uh, in the fall to finish up his bachelor credit so he can uh, take a test to become a deacon and eventually a priest in our denomination, the Anglican Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So my philosophy has always been take care of people. I've always been the individual, especially me as a Christian, it, it is my responsibility to take care of people who come into my life. Um, I once had a debate with a strong uh, Trump loving uh, Republican friend of mine who was arguing about uh, illegal immigrants and how he wanted to kick all of them out, even if they hadn't committed a crime. Um, and I, something that kind of clicked in his head was I told him is that when my husband becomes a priest, whoever walks through the door of our church we have to look at them as a child of God and nothing else. I can't look at that person and say they're an immigrant, they're an addict or anything like that. I have to look at them as a person, as a human with a soul. And I, they came, came into my life. I've got to take care of them somehow. Um, 
And my that's always been my philosophy. And one of the reasons I joined the Libertarian Party was because even though it had a reputation of being selfish, I knew for a fact because I, I was in the party that we did work towards uh, certain social justice reforms like criminal justice reform and uh, things like that. And even some of my uh, capitalistic beliefs were very centered around the belief of people. And that may sound strange to somebody who may more identify as uh, democratic socialist or anything like that, but I was always centered around people. And that was the thing I was kind of getting annoyed with some of the members of the Libertarian Party was, I didn't like that with this whole COVID-19 situation, there was a choice of either people lose jobs and they commit suicide or things like that, or people die of, of a cult, uh, die of the COVID-19. I was like, certainly there's a way that we could meet in the middle and take care of people's lives and livelihoods. And it didn't, and I actually had somebody tell me that there's no middle ground in freedom. And I was like, but you're, but, and I would explain to him, I was like, cause we were, we're the party of personal responsibility. And the philosophy I always used was you're allowed to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone. Well, unfortunately, in the circumstances we're in now, going to a large gathering, you know, not wearing a mask when you go to the grocery store, that's hurting somebody. So you have to take your responsibility. And I felt like nobody really wanted to. So. Okay, yeah. Um, so I do want to uh, give a shout out to the people who have some questions. And then I'll, I'll kind of take my turn at, at answering this. And then if you have more to follow up on, please, please jump in. Sure. Um, so, uh, and thank you, Aaron, a while ago for clarifying you couldn't hear the dog, that's helpful. Um, so, uh, Chris had shared earlier, I would love to see prices for different procedures and doctors competing as someone who does not have health insurance right now. Um, and, um, I'm guessing that's referring to kind of like the, the, the talk we were having earlier about, uh, healthcare mm -hmm. policy and a way to move forward so it's affordable for folks. Um, so Aaron asks, you have both left the Libertarian Party. Why and where are you now in your political beliefs? And then Chris followed up with something that I think is a very related question that goes right along with it. I think it's more about leaving a party and not changing beliefs. Is that right? Or maybe some of both. Um, and he, I think in response to something he said, said that's an extremist belief. If they say there is no middle ground or no ability to compromise. Um, so, so what I'm hearing from you, and please, after I take a minute here, uh, you know, chime in if I, if I miss something, is that for you, it has been more about leaving the Libertarian Party than having a, a, a major shift in your beliefs. Is that is that right? Uh, and, and a lot of that was because you were dealing with that extremism within the Libertarian Party, taking up so much of the philosophy? Um, or do you feel like that view that Chris was sort of describing as extremist is actually essential to libertarianism in a way that it no longer resonates with you as a philosophy. Well, I think with me, it, cause I kept saying, cause like libertarians still to this day accuse me of changing my beliefs. And I'm like, I don't think they've changed that much. Uh -huh. It's like, well, you want government involvement is like, yeah, because again, you're allowed to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting on anybody. That last part is a big deal to me. Yeah. Um, so with me, it was, I was, I was disappointed. Uh, so with the stress of all this, I decided uh, to take a break as the chair of the party. I've been the chair of the Libertarian Party for four years. And, the, and I've had issues with the party before because when you're the chair of the Libertarian part, Party, it's on you. Like every so often you can get volunteers. Mm -hmm. But it, you pro you've seen it. You, me and you, we've been down at uh, City Hall. We've been at different rallies. Who's the libertarian that's in the room? Me. Yeah, yeah. You're you're, you're frequently the resident libertarian, or you you know you're there with some people, but it's it's free. I, I do frequently see uh, token libertarian April Brown is with us today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so that was the frustrating thing. Like I would try to get people to uh, be a part of the different activities. I would like, I really was disappointed when I couldn't get anybody to go to the cash bail reform uh, from my, my side. 
we were able to team up with Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement and Athens for Everyone, but I was the only libertarian there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity for us. And, and I get, we're all busy. We all have jobs, people have families and all that, but it's like, and I would say, hey, who wants to come? And I would post it on the Facebook group or anything like that. And nobody responded. I'm like- So it sounds like there is also like some kind of burnout going on for you of just like the, the role as well compounding yeah. with all of this so yeah. that was building up and also i wanted to kind of focus on some of my other passions mm -hmm. like because i've been the chair of the party for four years i haven't been able to audition for a play and when i first moved to athens i was very much involved in the local theater scene mm -hmm. and i missed being in the theater and i miss being in plays and all that and so, but because i was constantly busy meeting up with people and planning events and all that, I knew I couldn't dedicate, you know, dress rehearsals, tech week and all that uh, for it. So I took a break. So after a while, it, and then this started building up to where I was constantly arguing with the libertarians that I said, you know what, four years is enough. And I talked to the state party and I said, I, I'm very sorry, but I'm gonna have to be selfish mm -hmm. for a little bit. I said, I, at first I was like, I'll help you find somebody to replace you with, but then it started getting worse because then I saw libertarians from the state party going to these reopened Georgia rallies where social distancing mm -hmm. is not happening. And then, uh, and then what really grind my gears was after I decided to leave the party was up until just today, the Libertarian Party National was planning of having a convention. They already planned it in May. They lost their spot because of course they did because no idiots. It was like, what are you doing? Do you, why do you want a lawsuit? Is, it, is this the hill you're really, re literally willing to die on? Yeah, yeah. And um, so it was different things like that. It was a mix of, ideology and really holding on to that and i'm like listen we're in the we're not in a normal situation we're in a pandemic we're going to probably have to compromise a little bit and nobody was willing to do that and i was burnt out and i was just like i'm done so ovita thornton says that uh she's watching commissioner thornton so hi she says hi to you specifically and hi ovita thanks for chiming in hi, and um I think I'll take a stab here at trying to answer all these questions at once. So Aaron mm -hmm. and Chris is from earlier, along with uh, Megan, who's uh, almost cheating a little bit by sitting in the room with me and asking, April, you identified yourself as an open market capitalist. Jesse, you got excited to dive further into that. Please, please, please dive in, friends. <laughs> um, so uh, I, there was a time, I, I think Aaron's question kind of came first of, um, you have both uh, left the Libertarian Party, why and where are you now in your political beliefs? So growing up, um, I've always had, I guess, kind of like a rebellious streak that I would also now kind of describe as like a, a solidary streak, you know, like a really a compulsion to like connect with other people and try to uplift people who it seems are being left out or hurt in some way. Right. Um, and how to go about that for me has changed a lot over the years and I'm sure it'll continue to change in the years ahead too. Um, but as like a, a teenager, I remember being, my introduction to political stuff was, a, was mostly like punk rock and bands like Rage Against the Machine and System of a Down who woke me up to like the Zapatista movement and the Armenian genocide and kind of these big things that happened or were happening at that time in the world that I was like totally unaware of. Um, and, and their method of um, addressing that stuff was through art and I was really inclined toward music. So for many years, music was kind of my outlet and how I thought of political action and political organizing was like very abstracted and hard to really think of how to act upon, um, except like voting maybe, and then having discussions with people about kind of vaguely what was wrong and wouldn't it be cool if there was a big strike or wouldn't it be cool if the ending of Fight Club looked a lot like what happens in the real world and like all the credit card companies could just like be blown up or something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and all of our debt could go back to zero. These kind of like, fantastically oversimplified ideas about social change. And um, and so I also, f I gravitated towards different beliefs that included like, I really like the Green Party and I really like the Libertarian Party. 
at the same time. Uh, and I felt profoundly frustrated with both of the two major parties the whole time. I felt very disappointed, not represented, uh, and in many ways like horrified by all the ways that like the Democrats and Republicans as like large party institutions, not necessarily individual people in them, mm -hmm. um, frequently actually at odds with the individual people who vote or participate in those parties, but like that those large institutions uh, really seem to be perpetuating, you know, wealth inequality and war and genocide abroad and uh, a horrific carceral state with, you know, millions of people in prison and on and on. And, uh, and Ron Paul became this figure that I got uh, excited about. This was back when I still lived in Massachusetts. I actually also grew up Catholic, uh, although I don't <laughs> still really participate in the Catholic Church in any meaningful way, but I guess, you know, once a Catholic, always a Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm actually a convert. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. I went from uh, evangelical to Anglo-Catholic. <laughs> okay. I like, I like how there's like so many ways that our paths, despite not really being personally connected individually, like we've had these parallel things. So you took my spot maybe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, in Massachusetts, um, Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, so I was living in Mass and I got excited about Ron Paul. There's some people I worked with really liked Ron Paul. I was working as, at a pizza place delivering pizzas. Um, and I remember like the Ron Paul revolution where they had love backwards and there's this mm -hmm. real emphasis on love and human connection. And I think a lot of what really resonated with it uh, for me was this idea of like human connection and this idea of like not being corrupt, being like an honest person, that there could be such a thing as an honest politician still. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that Ron Paul really had like fundamental critiques of what was wrong in like society, including but not limited to the government. Um, and at the time, I also had this idea that like the problem with our economy was that capitalism had kind of run amok. Um, and, and so, and this is something I think you hear a lot from people, whether they identify as like Democrat or Republican or Libertarian, that like um, the problem in America with wealth inequality isn't fundamentally capitalism, but that like it's the way that capitalism has like really gone off the rails. And now we have these like mega billionaires. And so we need something to keep them in check, um, which might look more like heavy regulations through the government or might look more like changes in our behaviors in society or in the business sphere to change that depending on your ideology but generally it seems like there's this idea that there's a a major uh problem uh but that problem isn't itself capitalism just sort of the way it's playing out right now and occupy occurred um a few years after i had moved to georgia and so uh at the time uh ron paul was still a figure um Although he's kind of on his way out and his son, Rand, who I wasn't ever really much of a fan of, has become the, the more well-known Paul now. Uh, Rand disappointed I, I remember, me. what was that? Rand disappointed me. Yeah. He had a strong beginning and then I was just like, oh, what you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, when he, when he came out of his father's shadow and really came into his own, it, it, it seemed to be uglier and uglier over time. That's kind of how I felt. Uh, but uh, yeah. um, so I, I remember Occupy happening, and I, I still generally have these ideas, but I was really inspired. I'd been following, you know, what ha had happened with the Arab Spring and then, like, the European summer and kind of the spread of these, like, revolutionary movements and the way the Tunisian government was – with the threat of violence, but actually peacefully like overthrown and replaced in like 10 days, you know, and Iceland wrote their own new constitution after these like mass demonstrations in the streets. And it felt like that global movement was coming to the US through Occupy. So it's like, heck yeah, I can't wait to be a part. And then I heard Occupy Athens was happening. I can't wait to go. And, and I had this just in incredibly dense learning experience over the next half a year while Occupy was kind of the banner that an array of people were flying to do a, a variety of things, including the act of occupying space as well as like opposing the public curfew law and putting out an alternative newspaper and things like this. Um, mm. And it was through that work that I um, not only learned how to actually apply 
myself politically in like real meat space and not just like watching the daily show and complaining about it to my friends over drinks or at a punk show but um that i i began to look at things a bit differently uh and i think if i could summarize because i know i've been going on for a bit here like where the big shift was for me away from libertarianism was that i see uh American libertarianism, I guess there's one other thing I kind of want to share. Usually in, the, in most of the world, the word libertarian is kind of synonymous with anarchist. Um, but in the US and now the UK, it's this kind of brand of uh, some anarchism beliefs mixed with like capitalism. And I think these, these kind of like individual individualistic societies that we're a part of, um, sort of influencing anarchism with an idea of individualism that pulls it away from the ways in which anarchism falls under a socialist umbrella and it's about mm -hmm. like kind of human connection and, and societal structures that we share the power in creating into like individual responsibility and that the emphasis is really on that individual responsibility and i kind of think like the way i see it now is that that idea of responsibility is maybe the, the key um that like libertarian and like a more global anarchist sense is that we have like um the 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 freedom to behave as uh i mean well fundamentally anarchist would be that you're that there's just no hierarchy right but then beyond that um that nobody has like a, a right to exert their will over another which is mm -hmm. kind of built into this idea that guides like american libertarianism right which is that do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting another person um, and I think, uh, if we reframe that question to be less about like what our individual action is first, and instead we start from the premise of like, what's the context that we're a part of. And I think this is where my, my shift started to happen. It's like, oh, like, regardless of what I think or do, I'm actually a part of this society already where these things are already in play that are bigger than me. And even if I don't have control over them, um, I am caught up in that momentum. And, and and big parts of that for me during Occupy and since have been around understanding like capitalism and the economy and race and like the legacy of slavery and and um, discrimination and Jim Crow and redlining and all this stuff and how that's like and colonialism, you know, before slavery and how that has kind of given us what we have now. Um, and so there's this idea of like privilege that used to really like irk me because I actually grew up like in a really unstable like very like economically poor uh environment uh and being told that i was like privileged was just like really hard to make sense of um mm. now i i see that differently and i i see that like oh like the my odds were just better by virtue of being white you know the way i was responded to had just been different my whole life because like presenting mm. as and being raised as the male you know and like how that how that goes um, and so when I think of like how to apply all that politically, where I've wound towards uh, liking socialism more than like libertarianism at this point, uh, and I, I usually go with, like democratic socialist, I, I, I like the DSA a lot, I, I like the Bernie Sanders campaign a lot, is that um, like the best apparatus we have in society for bringing out that compassion for for taking this this thread that I think you're right we most people do share of like wanting to be right by each other is to use government institutions um, to to carry them out um, and then I think where I still align with my like beliefs that I used to think of as libertarian and I think this is where there's a strong overlap with you but now I tend to use the word anarchist instead is that like the state is also an institution to be suspicious of. <laughs> You know, and there are there are deep, deep problems in how it's run, and there are problems of hierarchy. And then, you know, in our world, and especially in this country, uh, socialist ideals can't be enacted independent of capitalism because that's still happening at the same time. And so, like, I think of a socialist approach as just changing that paradigm to be um, about how we can build more compassionate and equitable structures for each other while recognizing mm -hmm. the history we've come from. And then that anarchist identity that I bring to it is how do we continue to question and um, evaluate the structures that are in place 
to to make sure that they don't become like too powerful or oppressive, recognizing that they already kind of fundamentally are. And so how do we kind of like flatten that power? Um, but so that, that ended up being a while, but I guess that's kind of like my very long explanation of where I'm at now. Um, yeah. And I'm curious where in there, you, you've kind of moved from libertarian to, you know, you, you did say there's kind of a difference of identity. At least you said this before we started this chat when I put in the description of like, you now think of yourself more like an independent. Right. right? Is that accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, as someone who's like kind of aware of all these different terms already, like you, you went through this, like there's different things about libertarianism or the libertarian party that are kind of increasingly leaving me disappointed and frustrated. Um, and you went with independent and like, like why that term now of all the options to go to? I decided to go as independent because for a while, like I said, I would, I figured I would just step down as chair, but I could still be a libertarian, but um, libertarians have a reputation and their reputation isn't exactly not warranted you know i guess you could say there's yeah. there's a reason for it and again to me it was the reason why i decided to leave the party was what i felt like their priorities they were uh, all of a sudden now i was seeing chapters going to the uh reopening america uh uh protests but i was like i couldn't get we can't get any of you down at the capitol for and not to say can't get any because the state party and a lot of state party members were going down to the capitol for criminal justice reform uh marijuana legalization things like that but i was like really this is this is what you you're choosing to do out of all the things that we could touch on because there's a variety of dis different subjects that libertarians can but this one that could really hurt people is the one that you're wanting to go with and so, and I did get accused of some libertarians saying you're leaving the party because of one thing. And I said, this one thing can hurt people. Um, but it was different things like that. I decided to go independent because I thought about it. And my husband, you know, my husband's, uh, people always found funny. I was a registered libertarian. He was a registered Republican. Um, voted for Kemp, very disappointed in him. <laughs> voted for Kemp, won't do it again. Um, but my husband, even when uh, him as a registered Republican, he would have debates with me about UBI, uh, universal basic income, and how he thought it was a good idea. And he showed me uh, articles of how Milton Friedman, who was like a god amongst men in the Libertarian Party, you know, he's this economic genius, and I still love Milton Friedman, uh, made the case for universal basic income. There were actually several libertarian economists that were making cases for reparations for slavery. Um, but I decided to go uh, independent because of the work I've done as the chair of the Libertarian Party. Um, my whole philosophy was I was going to work with different groups because that's how you get things done. I can't mm -hmm. try to take over somebody's project if they've already invented the wheel. There's no possible way. But if somebody's already doing something like Mocha Johnson and and Noah Johnson at Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement or Athens for Everyone. And it was something that I agreed with. I was jumping on, on and I was gonna help them. And I found some, and I guess uh, I was looking for balance. Then, you know, I, I've always described myself as fiscally conservative, socially liberal, you know, even though I hate those two terms, but you know, that was, that was something easy I could describe people. Um, you know, I love my small businesses and I want to see them thrive. Um, I, and I don't necessarily believe that higher taxes, even on the ultra rich is going to save our pro is going to fix our problems because the people in Washington don't know how to spend the money. So no matter how much money you give them, they got to figure out how to spend it first. Um, Wait, I so can I, I know that you did want to go right at, at nine because um, you have another another place you have to be. And we've, we really <laughs> whipped through this hour. Um, but I, I'm, if, if, if you don't mind me jumping in here, I'm curious, um, you, uh, you don't like the idea necessarily of taxing the super rich. I'm hearing you say, which is which is definitely a specific policy that I I do like a lot, um, yeah. 
And I, I'd love to kind of dig into that maybe as like our sort of case study idea for mm. how um, I think you and I also kind of differ on this idea of like you describe yourself as a, a free market capitalist still, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I and I don't. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So so I'm like, uh, but you know we're, we are certainly living in a capitalist society, right? So we're both trying to find a way forward in this society, and I think we're both trying to way, find a way forward that uh, isn't so harmful to people. Um, so, um, I have some thoughts on this, but before I go, why, why don't you like the idea of taxing the super rich? And let's go all the way to the top and say, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, which is with his $139 billion. Um, how do you think, how do you think we as a society should respond to Jeff Bezos fortune? It's not necessarily that I don't like the idea of of taxing the super rich uh, or anything like that. Now, I will say this. One thing that did change that with me was uh, when I found out that Jeff Bezos, owner of Whole Foods and Amazon, was not doing right by his employees during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was really hoping that somebody who considers themselves a philanthropist would actually say, hey, he gets sick. You're paid. You're covered. Don't worry. And I'm going to start implementing some things. And and I didn't feel like he he did that. Uh, so I was disappointed. My issue was as far as taxation goes. And I know I I tried never to be the libertarian that screamed tax taxation is theft at everyone because I knew I'd do that. You shut me. Everybody was going to shut me down completely. My issue with as far as uh, as far as taxation goes and all that is that to me it is not how much the U.S. is bringing in as far as revenue goes. It is how much what and what they're spitting out. So they're wasting. So to me, there's a lot of waste in, especially in the federal budget. There's waste in war. There's waste in uh, our criminal justice. I put justice in quotation marks system. Uh, yeah, people, you, you, you talk about universal health care and it's always how you're going to pay for it. On the local level, you know, you talk about uh, bus service and it's how you're going to pay for it. Nobody's ever asking presidential candidates, well, how are you going to pay for that giant military that you want to keep around? <laughs> how are exactly. you going to pay for that war is not usually the first question that follows talk about going to war. Uh, or, you know, on the local level, like, how are we going to pay uh, to keep imprisoning and, uh, you know, arresting and, and throwing through the ringer all these people in our society? Um, so I, I love that you, you kind of bring bring that up. Um, I think that's one of and, the many things we agree on. <laughs> and, and that was and that was my issues, especially like uh, I come from rural Georgia, like Athens is the biggest city I've ever lived in. And I don't really want to get uh, live in a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I, I'd have panic attacks if I lived in Atlanta, but I lived in rural Georgia, grew up there all my life. And so a lot of the, especially a lot of the guys I knew after high school, they went to the military and a lot of them came back. I would say nearly everyone that I know that uh, was a part of like post 9-11 or even pre 9-11 with the Gulf Wars did not come back right. And mm -hmm they were not taken care of in the way that I felt like somebody who had sacrificed for their country should have been taken care of, especially with things like the VA and all that. Um, but my whole thing was like, okay, instead of, uh, my whole thing is like, when it comes to as far as revenue, especially for a country, you gotta look at different ways. And the way I thought was we're wasting a lot of money on things like war and prisons and things like that when really we could save a lot of money if we just made these certain changes and also uh, I saw that you know we just went ahead and legalized uh, cannabis on the uh, on the look on the federal level that would be huge and I I've always made the joke especially now is like quarantine is a great time to legalize marijuana right now <laughs> for everyone everybody Maybe start your own small business and a few planters on your porch <laughs> exactly <laughs> um but it was kind of it was one of those things like that to where you know there is an argument in the libertarian circles to where uh you know you 
you know, I, I think people are talking, you know, I think people have mentioned like taxing like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all that at uh, 70, 80, 90%. And I'm like, Ugh. and I, 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 could I make a case for that? Um, you could try. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I, usually with, with these chats, I like to give whoever's the, the guest, the one who, cause I'm always here, you know, so I like to give you the last word. I know you want to go at nine. Um, sure. So I'd like to take a stab at this and I'd, I'd love to give you the last word on your thoughts. Um, All right. So you can have a, a real life person making that argument to shred with your with your final word if you'd like. <laughs> um, okay. And then hopefully hopefully we do get to talk again. I've really enjoyed this. So thank you so much for for being oh, here. anytime. Um, so uh, I think of violence. Um, which can be defined in many ways, but I think of systemic violence. And, you know, we've both talked about how like war and the prison system are things that disgust us, uh, that are very violent in our society. Um, and I think that a case needs to be made that wealth is violence. Um, and having as much wealth as someone like Bezos or Gates or really anyone who has more than a billion dollars. So I, the, the, my new mantra is a billion is too much. I, I believe that we should have a minimum wage and I also believe that we should have maximum wealth. Once you hit a billion, you just, you got enough. Nobody needs that much to begin with. You're doing all right. At that point, everything else you make can help keep you ensuring that you're a billionaire, but the rest just goes back to society. As imperfect as the state is, I think we can both agree that there's a lot of things that need to change about the way our government is operating and probably has always operated. Um, I think that the best tool we have for getting that wealth out of the hands of so few and redistributing mm -hmm. it to the masses that would benefit greatly um, from, from that redistribution is, is the state, is the government. Um, and I do believe that we need to do more democratizing of our government to ensure that that's happening in a way that is actually compassionate and effective. Um, and and so fundamentally to me, I think of the idea of having wealth as a violent act and no amount of philanthropy that a billionaire can do makes up for the, the being violent and having that wealth. So like if I go around murdering people every day, uh, but then at night I uh, give people massages and cook people dinner, I don't, and, and, and maybe even save a couple lives, you know, I go around lifeguarding at the beach or something. I don't think that makes up for the murdering of the people by day. And so that's kind of how I see wealth when we get to this scale. And when we look at how wealth inequality has exponentially gotten worse over time and how much, uh, how much we could do if we took that uh, wealth from that super minority of people and spread it out. Um, I feel like there is like an ethical imperative for us as a society to do that. Um, and as imperfect as I think the state is, I think the, the best tool we have at our disposal right now is, is the government and the taxes it can levy. So uh, with that uh, on the fly argument, I would love for you to share the final word, please. <laughs> okay. Um, I can see your point, but um, as like I said, as far as like any sort of, it's one of those things to where it's like, I always said as a libertarian, you cannot legislate morality. And especially when you have the most immoral people on Capitol Hill. Um, so I guess, I guess, I guess that would, to me that, I guess that kind of sounds nice, but again, that would have to, that to me would have to be putting a lot of trust into a very flawed system of very flawed people who have been in their positions for 30, 40 or more years. Um, I think one of the things that you and I can definitely agree on is that big reform needs to happen on the federal level. Uh, how we prioritize spending needs to happen. Um, and my personal belief is, and it's, and I think this is one to go back how I became how, how now I identify as independent. Me personally, uh, I remember I went to a rally. It was the poor people's rally actually at uh, 
what Mocha Johnson and Athens anti-discrimination movement was holding. And one of the speakers there said, we need to burn this whole system down to the ground and start from the ashes. The way I see doing that is completely burning down the Republican and Democratic Party, the GOP and the DNC, uh, to, and just have no parties at all whatsoever. Um, you know, that was some of the things that our that the founding fathers of America said, we don't want parties, and look what we did. <laughs> and it's made things so much worse. And the power is within those parties. Uh, not necessarily with the, uh, my issue is not with Democrats themselves or Republicans themselves. My problem is the puppet masters that are at the top that are pulling the strings to get their way. And that's what, and that to me is the big problem I'm seeing on the Hill is the Democrats and Republicans, they're not, they're fighting each other, not, not working together. So I'd love to see that burn to the ground. Um, so, so sharing that distrust of the people currently in power, being able to do a great job with it. Uh, and I think you're right that like we can't legislate morality, but mm -hmm. we do, um, well, I'm going to save the bus. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm, I'm seeking maybe some clarity on uh, when when we look at a fortune above a billion dollars, am I hearing that you you do agree that like some amount of that, if not, so my argument is everything over a billion. I don't know if you would say that, but but a substantial portion, we'll say, of the Bezos, Gates, and other billionaires' fortune uh, should be redistributed. Is that something you kind of agree with? I will say at the moment, not necessarily. Okay. No, no, I will say this. One thing that you and I can agree on is that I don't like the loopholes that a lot of billionaires do use in order to avoid paying some tax, uh, paying taxes and all that. Uh, uh -huh. You and I, I think we can agree with that, that it, like I've always, I've been a big uh, advocate and I'm sure you probably disagree on the fair tax system. Um, but to me, I like that system because it gets rid of those loopholes. Um, with the uh, fair tax, are you? Do you mean with the the flat tax rate and then close up the loopholes, or do you mean the fair tax you, system is when? And I know I, I I've gotten in a few discussions with a democratic socialist about this because it's it's basically strictly it gets uh, it gets rid of the income uh, the income tax, which I've been I've always been firmly against. Uh, especially, uh, I've especially been against the income tax when it comes to working class people and all that. Why your why your income is uh, taxed, I have no idea. But uh, yes, Chris is right. Uh, the fair tax system is basically it's when it's like a, a flat uh, tax on sales. So okay. it, yeah. so it wouldn't be necessarily on necessary items like tampons or food or things like that. But like every time you uh, but like. Uh, television, wine, cigarettes, you know, uh, clothes, things like that, you know, that's when, and that way, every time. And would that apply to estates as well? So if I don't buy a house, but my very wealthy billionaire grandfather gives me a mansion, do I pay taxes on the mansion? I mean, would, to me, uh, it would still, it wouldn't just be so, it would, you would still have, uh, and it's something that uh, lib libertarians talk about as far as like, property taxes and things like that. Um, uh, I think that would still be a thing. Uh, I'm sorry, I am not the greatest verbal debater. I'm much better writer than I am a speaker. No, this is great. I mean, we're really just having a chat. And honestly, the number of people watching us are what, dozens, you know? So like, it's, it's pretty chill, you know? But um, uh, it's I think you've been awesome. where it's like, uh, how do I explain it? Um, Okay, we will. Um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta wrap up? Yeah, yeah actually, okay. oh, it's 9.06. I actually, tell you what, uh, you and I definitely need to, after this whole COVID situation, we need to meet up for coffee. But uh, Totally, yeah, I would love to do that. Um, but or at a distance before the whole thing's over, we can figure out something, yeah. But yeah, and definitely if you ever wanna do this again, this is, that's awesome too. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I have no idea how the, the kitchen table chats thing is going to evolve over time, but whether it's uh, a public or a less public forum, I would love to continue this conversation. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Um, and uh, we will see 
Y'all, uh, for those of you watching, thank you so much for watching and participating. Maureen McLaughlin is going to be the person I do with next, do this with next. Um, she's an awesome activist. She's been in town for decades and she lived through and helped organize the Vietnam era protests that were until the protests against the Trump inauguration that uh, I, I was a part of helping organize with many, including her. Uh, they were they were the largest uh, protests in town for, for held that record for years. So we're talking with Maureen about organizing marches against the Vietnam War and since. Um, April, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate you uh, digging in with someone who you knew would have some different ideas and sharing sharing yours, giving some stuff to think about. And we'll, uh, we'll see all y'all, including hopefully you, April, next time. Bye, thanks so Bye. much again. Yeah. Um, this is always the part where I don't know what to click to end the live stream. So it's probably just an awkward ending for a second.